I'd like the call to order for tonight's meeting. Agenda. Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Davis. Yes. Vice Chair Milligan. Here. Treasurer DeVarty. Marty here. Secretary Hatcher. Here. Trustee Fleming. Here. Trustee McKnight Wharton. Here. Trustee Milstein. Here. We're right. here motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Board. All in favor? Aye. Tab A is the Board of Trustees closed session meeting. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the May 13th, 2024 closed session meeting as submitted. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? No moved. Support. Favor? Aye. 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 Abby, is the recommendation that the Board of Trustees <laughs> approve the minutes of the 20, excuse me, May 21st, 2024 closed session meeting as submitted? Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to tab C. Recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the June 25, 2024 monthly meeting as submitted. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? I moved. Support. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to verbal communication, WCC Education Association, Mr. Wooten. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is David Wooten. I'm the first VP of the WCCEA. Uh, Allison couldn't be here tonight because she's out of town, so I'll be making the remarks. Uh, July 2024. The summer is flying by and the new academic year is just around the corner. Um, as we move forwards towards fall 2024, the WCCEA leadership has been working with the college to address concerns and trepidation about all the changes that are coming in fall of 2024. So we are thankful for the open dialogue with the administration to try and resolve these challenges in order to have a smooth start to the semester and to the new academic year. So there are still some concerns regarding reliable uh, online proctoring, uh, the use of our testing center here on campus, and the Canvas LMS migration. Um, but I am hopeful that we can continue to have thoughtful and productive conversations to get us towards that common goal, which of course is student success. As many of you know, WCC will be phasing out <laughs> developmental education courses starting in winter of 25. So our developmental education faculty have been working diligently to find common ground with a co-requisite model while maintaining our accessibility as a community college. Washtenaw is a community college and therefore we do not want to put up barriers that will limit the access to, of the community to pursue their educational goals. We must find a balance between these new state standards and our role as an open educational institution serving all aspects uh, and needs of our community. And finally, I just want to take a moment here to honor uh, several faculty that will be retiring at the end of this summer. So we have Amir Fayez, Hiralal Dadhida, Elizabeth Thoburn, Julie Kissel, my dear friend, Jason Withrow, Terry Abrams, Mike Duff, Justin Carter, Rosemary Wilson, and Bill Abernathy. And realize that combined, these faculty represent over 265 years of um, experience and institutional knowledge here at WCC, which is quite something impressive. We obviously are thankful for their service to our students, uh, to this college and to this community. They will all be missed dearly and we wish them well on their new journey into retirement. Thank you. Vanessa, I mean, excuse me, are there any uh, public comments? Trustee. Oh, excuse me. I certainly can. I certainly can. So that list was Amir Fayez, <clears throat> Hiralal Dedhia, Elizabeth Thoburn, Julie Kissel, 
Jason Withrow, Terry Abrams, Mike Duff, Justin Carter, Rosemary Wilson, and the immortal Bill Abernathy. And that number was over 265 years of service. Absolutely, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Are there any public comments? Okay, hearing none. Vanessa, were there any written communication? Yes, there was one received, and I sent it out kind of late today, so I provided it in your folders for you. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Moving on to special reports. Um, Department of College and Career Readiness Annual Update by VP Tucker. <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Always a pleasure to come to you each year to provide a report on our activities through our Department of College and Career Readiness, uh, more specifically at Park Ridge Community Center and Ellsworth Center. Each year we try to provide a framework for why we do this work. Uh, we know that we have a large county, um, but a number of years, 1994 to be exact, we started focusing on what we could do on the eastern side of the county uh, for this specific reason. A few years ago, we started to provide the board with a uh, snapshot of what it looks like um, across eastern Washtenaw County, specifically at Census Track 4106, which is located um, in the Park Ridge Community Sense Corridor. Um, we realize that these numbers have changed a little bit from last year. Last year, um, the high school graduation rate was around 79%, uh, so that's declined slightly. Um, the bachelor's degree attainment in that area uh, also decreased to around 15%. Um, and we know when we compare that across our county, specifically uh, to Ann Arbor or Superior Township, um, those are staggering numbers. What is even more staggering is looking at the per capita income. Um, this number has continued also to decrease. Last year was around 18,000 per capita income and the median household income slightly went up from about 26,000 to 29,000. But what is most, um, I think, notable is the persons living below the poverty line. Um, most, or oftentimes we forget that within Washington County, overall is around 20% are living in poverty. But in this part of the county, um, almost 40%. Um, and this is what is able to be documented. We know that the undocumented numbers probably push that closer to 50 percent. One um, thing that we tried to do over the last four years is to begin to focus um, not just on some of the fun things that we used to do, but to really create a pathway for what we call college and career readiness, knowing that we've been doing it for over 20 years. Um, but in 2021, the board might remember, um, we shifted from doing just a summer camp to a true summer learning experience uh, where individuals, um, our kids, 48 of them would go through an intensive program um, that would leave them with not just uh, life skills, but also uh, hopefully help with their academics. I want to recognize the team. Some of them are here today. Um, Dr. Stephanie Craw, who is our executive director of College Access and Success, uh, who is leading our D3C3 project, um, has been shepherding this work over the last year, um, as well as Cheryl Harvey. Some might remember she was our director. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say right after Cheryl. Oh, okay, I was going to stand up. You know, no, no, no problem. Um, Cheryl used to be our director of the Center for Career Success. Um, and she transitioned about six months ago to this role to really give back to a community where she lives. So um, now, drum roll, um, Dr. Craw <laughs> and, and Cheryl, um, um, they are new leaders and we're excited for what they've been able to bring to the team. In addition, Mia, uh, who, who was at the college for a number of years previously uh, in our diversity and inclusion office, she's our manager that really provides the on the ground support. Um, and then we have two new staff that are part time externally funded um, individuals to help elevate some of the academic as well as some of those life skill programs. The dream team is what we call them. Um, one thing that we realized was uh, we used to focus heavily on elementary school. Um, and we, we never will abandon that mission, um, but there was a gap for those that were in eighth through 12th grade. 
Um, and the board might remember um, last year we had to pivot away from doing our traditional after school program because of the bell schedule changes with YCS. Um, they were getting out of school to after four o'clock and, and that impacted our programming. So we took the programming to them. Um, we created a new partnership with YCS, um, Belleville High School, a number of schools across uh, our county in that area. Um, and would go into the schools to provide um, not just the career readiness piece, but also a soft skills and college piece. And we know um, that we received external funding um, from the county to be able to do this work. I'm happy to report that over the last year, um, we increased the number of participants that we traditionally would have been able to touch after school. 20 or 30 was the max usually after school. We touched 77 participants um, in, across those, those high schools and middle schools uh, within the county. And what we were able to do was not just come in and talk about career opportunities, how to make sure that you're maintaining your grades to be able to one day be a WCC dual enrolled student or um, after you graduate to come here, but also brought them to campus so they could see some of the academic programs that we have at some of our labs to just try to gain exposure. We've continued our Saturday Academies, um, our girls group and our Young Men of Purpose, uh, which is really focused on making sure that we're able to pour into those young minds um, with the idea that they will one day go to WCC, but also that they would be able to uh, eradicate some of the issues that they might see in community. Our girls group, um, which focuses on 12 to 18 year olds, um, focuses in a number of areas to to speak to the entire development of that young girl uh, academically, socially, um, from a career standpoint. Um, this program, it happens on Saturdays from 12 to 2 um, and it is culminated with an exposure trip. The board might remember that three years ago we started getting some external support to be able to provide experiences to these young girls um, that they traditionally would not be able to have. First time flying on a plane. This year we had five out of the 12. This was their first time flying. Um, that we had returning girls, uh, which is something that the team has been trying to work on from a retention perspective. So out of the 12 girls, um, there's generally 20 to 25 that participate, 12 that actually make it on the trip, um, five return from last year. Um, each of those students uh, was able to get a $250 stipend so that equity was not an issue, knowing that in the past, one or two girls would have money from their parents and a large majority would not. We also know these girls didn't have luggage. So each year we're able to provide them luggage and travel items to ensure that they have a really good experience. This year's trip was to Nashville. Um, they stayed at an amazing hotel. They had a lot of tours and it culminated with a tour at HBCU, uh, Tennessee State uh, University. As we shift from our young girls to our young boys, um, Young Men of Purpose um, does very similar work. Um, they um, met throughout the year grades six through eight um, and focused on everything from self-awareness, um, learning about new career pathways. Um, and there is uh, a, a brotherhood circle that they establish where if you notice um, the 15 or 20 boys that are in this picture, um, there's equally amount of men. Uh, if not double, that come out on Saturdays uh, from across our community. Um, you know, there's doctors, there's uh, social service leaders, there's educators, uh, people that are in industry to really show an example of what those boys can be. And of course, we have a number of partners that are listed there because both our young uh, girls um, group as well as our young men of purpose, it cannot be done with our team, just our team. We need partners in community. Uh, what is uh, our, our, our greatest experience we have in the summertime each year? Uh, we've launched as of July 8th, our summer experience 2024. Um, those students are coming to Park Ridge 845 um, to up to five o'clock with aftercare. Um, we've shifted, as we mentioned before, that um, summer learning experience program to be heavily focused on academics with a dose of fun here and there. Um, and one thing that we've been able to add over the last three years because of external funding is every Friday a field trip. Um, we've continued to maintain state certified teachers that are working with those um, uh, young men and young girls um, in math and reading 
and then a number of partners in community. Uh, because as you will notice, uh, with 48 kids and uh, nine staff, um, only three part-time, you saw the two part-time uh, on the screen earlier, and then some summer staff, um, it's a lot to manage going on these trips. Uh, so we have some interns, um, as well as our teachers pitch in, and then our community partners. Um, they're getting um, breakfast, lunch, and snacks daily. Um, and most often ask, how much does all of this cost? Um, $375? Something like that. Yeah, three seventy five. Um, and when you think about that, that's three seventy five for sit for five weeks. Most summer camps are two to three hundred dollars for one week. Um, and most don't always provide you all, all the food that we provide. Um, so this has been um, a really good experience that is currently underway. Uh, you'll see there's a number of STEM based activities uh, each week, um, starting off with the University of Michigan Bio Innovations and Brain Cancer Research culminating all the way to square one and the semi foundation. And then week five, which we always give you an invitation to come to the graduation. Um, 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 I want to remind you that week five, we have a, cre a creature, teacher, animal experience. I've been practicing that all day. Uh, that you can come and see some amazing creatures that you would never want to have in your home. Um, so, real? Um, yes, real creatures, real creatures. I don't know what type of creatures, what type of creatures. We'll welcome every one of you on that day. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing that we found specifically to the participants was many of them did not learn how to swim. And <clears throat> we know that that is a um, issue with this age group. So we embedded swim lessons into the actual summer camp over the last couple of years at Rutherford Pool. Um, and then Thursday, there's some specialty sessions. So um, looking at the Watershed Conservancy with Huron River, um, the Michigan um, Medicine Health Multicultural Programming, depending on the age, we're trying to make sure that it's a dose of, of education, but also a dose of fun. So I mentioned our Friday field trips. Those are a few areas that we have um, gone to or will be going to the Spring Valley Trout Farm in Dexter, um, the Detroit Zoo, um, the Big Game Center right over in Ipsy, um, Legoland, and then, of course, Imagination Station. And it's important to note um, that these trips cost money, but we've been able to secure significant support across our county to provide these experiences to these young people. Um, majority, when I say majority, probably 95% of the participants this year were fully funded by Ypsilanti uh, Community Schools or the Housing Authority. Um, so it, uh, money is never a barrier. We have staff that will even donate the 375 to make sure that students get a chance to go. So money um, is never an issue. This is a list of community engagement and partnerships. One of the things that um, this department does is not only um, do things with our young people, but also convene um, through our Monday morning meetings, uh, which average about 30 or 35 participants from across the county. Uh, our elected officials are often on those meetings. Our community uh, partners are on those meetings to share what's happening in community. Um, and then, of course, a list of um, this is just a snapshot of the partners that either will do programming in Park Ridge uh, or will partner with us in some of our programming. What's important to uh, also note, and I don't know why the numbers are off, but $207,000 is what this department was able to gain over the last year in external grants, one-time awards, uh, or just support. Um, and it's a variety. The county um, does um, support in a number of ways, United Way, our Ann Arbor Community Foundation, um, and Toyota through their Drive-In Possibilities program. We have um, finally moved into our Ellsworth Center. Uh, if the board might remember, we had to um, move from Harriet Street um, as Michigan Works moved, and we have been a partner there for many years. Um, this is just some pictures of that center that we have two classrooms. 
but we have access to the entire building when you look at other uh, meeting spaces. It is our goal um, as we walk through the next fiscal year to have some credit classes there. So we've been in contact with um, our academic departments about maybe offering a, B- a BMG 140, a business management course or an intro to communication, uh, knowing that in partnership with Michigan Works, many of their um, recipients of funding um, can start at Ellsworth and then eventually transition to main campus. But that also Park Ridge is going to become a a site for our our GED program. Um, And then we are working in partnership with Michigan Works to look at what type of of workshops and other skill programs can we provide for uh, their participants that may not be available today. Um, And then last but not least, we are going to reestablish our after school programming um, with a very focus on our middle school age children now that some of the bus schedules have changed over the next year. And I'll open it up for any questions that the board might have. See the home buyers education program on the bottom line there. How does that work? So Bank of Ann Arbor has been trying to have a greater presence in Ypsilanti. So they've actually come to us and we've been working with them where they've been offering home buyer workshops at Park Ridge um, and working with individuals on, you know, what does it mean to have good credit? What does it mean to have a down payment? What does it mean to start looking for your first home? Um, so that is part of a partnership with Bank of Ann Arbor. And I know they've done a few sessions and they want to continue that um, in the year to come. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. What about um, the U of M Credit Union? Um, I can't think of her name. Uh, Tiffany, who is the... Tiffany Ford. Tiffany Ford, yeah. Have you were able to contact them? That could be a possibility and we can look into that. I know they also are trying to do things in community. Uh, Bank of Ed Arbor just kind of led the charge and said, hey, we want to come like now. But that's something we can definitely, the team can follow up and look into because I know they've been a great partner to the college. I'm trying to think of some other names, but I can't think of it right now. But what I do, I'll get with you on that. Please. Okay. Thank you. I see a hatch. It is, um, if you're going down Ellsworth, um, leaving Ypsilanti, um, Ellsworth and Stone School. So right as you pass Stone School, uh, it's an old clean manufacturing building, probably about half a mile from Stone School. Yep. And if you would like a tour, we're always open to give you a tour. Trustee Milshine. Um, Great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, hearing and not that it's this isn't the first time that i'm hearing the poverty numbers um on the east side of our county but seeing it in writing and seeing it that it's almost or in hearing that it's almost 50 percent is um uh i it yeah i i I don't really know what to say other than it's it's devastating in my opinion um so i'd like to know what could we as a board and I guess I'm asking you, and I'm also asking your dream team, um, what what more can we do? What more? How how can we help um, the east side of the county more? I think from an advocacy perspective is just getting the word out that we have programming. Uh, one of the key tenets of our D3C3 project is at Vance Ipsy, right, where we're trying to get individuals in short-term programs a year or less they get them to forty to sixty thousand dollars a year after that six month to a year of training. So I think from a board just telling people that we have opportunities for not just high school students, because those opportunities, you know, are for them to dual enroll, but for their parents. Um, and that Park Ridge and our department is a resource that whether they're looking to get a new job, get a new skill, buy a house that we have partnerships that are there. So I think just getting the word out because we have been, um, the team has, has gone to 4th of July parades. They're tabling it. They were at the art fair just this past week, just getting the word out that if you know someone in Ypsilanti, that we have opportunities for them. Trustee Milligan. If, I, if you, Trustee oh, Milligan, if you don't mind, I just want to follow oh, up okay. on that. Yeah, just sure. Proceed go ahead. just a, a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I want more. And what I mean by that, I want, I'd love to get three action items that we can do 
Um, and like you're right now saying outreach, we can help with the outreach. How are we going to help with the outreach? Is it, do we need to send 10,000 postcards out to various households? Do we need to run a text campaign? What do we need to do on the marketing front in order to reach, um, uh, in order to reach the east side of the county? So I would love to know, I, I would really, um, I'd like to challenge you and your dream team to come up with things because the items I'm mentioning, you know, the text campaign, the uh, postcards are fairly inexpensive mm-hmm. that I think we need to do because we need to help the residents on the east side of the county. So I'd like to challenge you to come up with that list so that we can, as a board, make a decision that that's the right thing to do and we can allocate funds if needed to make sure that we move in the right direction there. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know, you wanted to say something. Can you remember it? Okay. (laughs) Um, That's not all we do on the east side of the county. And it would be great if we share with you everything that we do. This is just a snippet. We have a very, very close relationship with Ypsilanti schools. Um, Actually, we are, I can't even begin to tell you all the things. I really can't because there's so many. But we accept your challenge, but I would really like to make sure that, you know, the board knows. And I think, you know, you're new to the board. I think most of you do, but we, we do have a lot that we do with Ypsilanti. Um, we, and, but can always do more, you know, but I'd like to share that to see if there's any more ideas, if you don't mind. Okay. And we can okay. add something. Do I see Mel again? I gotta let her know. Be right with you. I don't know what the timeline is for uh, participation, enrollment, matriculation, but are there success stories that are coming out of our work that uh, young people could come before us, that could go to Kiwanis, to Rotary, Mm -hmm. and talk about this, to put real life experience in front of people that have no idea that, that this kind of good work is being done? Absolutely. I think we can look into that. I know that, uh, Marketing communication does a really good job at trying to capture some of those stories, but specific to this work, yeah. we have some that we can definitely highlight for sure. Love to hear them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Trustee McKnight Morgan. I'm going to try to make this as easy and painless as possible in speaking. Um, I'm going back. Um, it, the previous president that was here, um, Trustee um, Rick. Davis and I, we're on this committee, and one of the things that we targeted was the south side of Ypsilanti. And um, because of what was going on, um, dropouts, gangs, profusely with gangs, um, and a lot of other activity that was not being corrected. So um, what we did was we set up a program so that we can involve the Ypsilanti people. It worked a little bit, and I say a little, um, because the people in the south side of Ypsi are very um, skeptical of people coming in to help them and guide them. So it was very difficult. As much as I was in there and tried to, we brought in computers we brought in programs for them to learn how to uh, uh, operate the computers, how to build computers. We gave them computers once it was built. So we did a lot in the past. So this is now now what uh, VP Tucker is doing. He's bringing us up and further than we were trying to do then. We've had programmers in there. We have U of M students in there. We started, I mean, Computers were donated from this school to the Parkridge Center when it was when Anthony Williamson started. So, and then the teachers from Eastern and the teachers from U of M, you know, educa- educational students. So, what I'm saying is that there's a long list of history, and the suggestions that you're talking about, we can go further with. And there's other suggestions that um, Trustee um, Milliken and myself and even Angela, excuse me, Chair Angela, (laughs) um, 
you know, we can build on what we know and what we, the people that we know that can help out. And that's why I say, I know some people. Everyone in here knows people. And so once we get all of us, our minds together and make a list of the people that we know, we can start contacting them. We can say, contact VP Tucker. We can talk about what we're trying to do to help this community. And it's not so much, let me, let me back up. At one point when this school started, I'm going to be very clear about this. The city of Ypsilanti was not helping. Okay? I know that. They, they said that they weren't involved. They didn't want to help. So the schools was on their own and the college was on their own. So I'm giving you some history here. So I, I look at this, what we're doing now, and we're discussing this, and I am so proud of you for bringing this to our attention because this is so important. This is our community, and we're trying to bring these people up to where we are so they can flourish, especially the young people. And I'm so glad and happy that the ones that have come to this institution are doing very well and have been doing well. So we're doing, the, we are really doing good. So we just need to continue on with what we're doing. And thank you so much, you and your team. Thank Absolutely. You. It's the tape. I mean, you know, it's Stephanie, uh, yeah. Cheryl, and Mia, and, and the others, uh, exactly. they're passionate about this work. Um, and that's why they're there at 8 a.m. on Saturday, yeah. <laughs> at 8 p.m. on Friday sometimes. So it's a team effort. Okay, I have one more for you, uh, Trustee Hatcher. Um, I'd just like to encourage the uh, the middle school program with the youngsters um, uh, because the deficiency when they come to Washington is math. And that it somehow they have to learn, be exposed, that math is not impossible, that it's good, it's fun, it's wonderful. Um, I, I'm not talking about drilling math into them, but they need to have a more positive attitude about the possibilities of math. Um, otherwise, when they come here, we go anywhere. It's not going to work. They got to do the math. Um, and number two, um, I would encourage everybody to go to graduation yes. on the ninth. Yes. Because it's fun. <laughs> Trustee McKnight Morton, you had something else you wanted to add? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone Trustee else? Divardi. Oh, Trustee Devardi. Thank you. Just one quick idea. I know it's not like far afield, but for young people, it might be fun to have one of those Friday field trips be to our gaming center mm. and have a whole program set up for them so they could see some of the really fun stuff that would appeal to them that happens on this campus. Absolutely. Good idea. Anything else? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, moving on to our monthly reports. Monthly uh, personnel recommendation under tab D. Recommendation that the Board of Trustees approve the personnel recommendation as submitted. Do I hear a motion? Or any discussion? Yeah. Um, I'm really sorry that I didn't see some names on here that were read, read off. off. And one of them um, is Bill Abernathy. That's my buddy. August. August 15th? Yeah. So okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. But anyway, any, I, I just want to throw in my two cents on this. Uh, Bonnie Truon is an excellent person and has been, and she did a fantabulous job with the, um, the GED program. And the rest, I'm looking at their, their experiences. And like the young man said, this is, uh, years of experience but it's been going on for a while but you know what time moves on and you know it's people said okay it's time for me to leave i got a life after wcc so god bless them and i i wish them more happiness in their their civilian life <laughs> <laughs> trustee hatcher um, I have a quest a, a specific question about um, Megan Hickson, who is a content and access services specialist 
who does that person report to? That reports to Matthew Farthing in the library. In the library. Yeah, so those are our OVT positions. Yeah. Okay. Are the front, the front face of the library. Okay. And at some point um, in September, I suppose would be a good time to get a list of, of since January, all the people who've left. Um, you know, faculty and staff, so we can have a sense of. Uh, what's happening there? Is it um, here in the library you speak No, speaking no, in, of, the or just in general, in the college, because there've been a lot of people leaving, um, and I just like to have a list of them and know how I many. Like I love lists. I yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're on one of them, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so surprise me, you are on mine. Whoa, 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 whoa. I just wanted to make sure that I'm understanding <laughs> you correctly, Trustee Hatch. Yeah. That's why I had asked the question. I appreciate it. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. So we can um, go ahead and get move this to a motion. Do I hear a motion, please? It moved. Support. We already have. Thank you very much. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you so much, uh, Trustee DeVarty, for reminding me of that. Okay, moving on to remarks from members of the board of trustees. Anyone like to offer any remarks? Well, dinner was great. Thank you so much. I had a great time at the adult uh, transition ceremony. Um, it was my first year attending and what a great event um, to celebrate all those graduates, to hear the stories of how um, people turn their lives around um, thanks to the program. So it was great to be to be there. It was great to see the stories um, and it, um, it once again reaffirms why we're at this table. So I, and, I appreciate being there. What you, kind of attendance did you have? Uh, I, there were over, I believe, 70 graduates. I don't, I don't think all of them showed up. I believe over 40 graduates were there. Um, so it was a well attended and their families were there and mm -hmm. it was a true graduation ceremony. So it was it, it was really fun. and It was really fun to be a part of it as well. Um, and uh, congratulations to Bonnie on her upcoming retirement. I think she's done at the end of this uh, month. Um, what a huge accomplishment. And so um, I'd like to thank her for all that she has done to make that program as successful as it is and as successful as it will be. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was, I like going to the transition ceremony and I'm happy you had the experience to go, Trustee Milshine, because they, the, the trials and tribulations that they meet along their journey life and educational journey is um, punched at the end with an exclamation mark because when they show up you can just see the just the pure joy and you feel it in there so i'm happy you had that experience Trustee uh, i just wanted to to say uh alongside what uh trustee newshine said um i sat in the audience and I did that on purpose so that I can get the actual feeling and energy from the family and friends. And it was, it was enormous sitting there, listening to them talk and excited to see their loved one or friends crossing the stage or standing in line in front of us and just listening to them talk. It was it was really a great experience. I've done this before, and every time I've done this, um, I only a few times I sat in the audience. Usually I'm on the stage, but this time I said no, I want to sit, and it was really really a good experience because listening to the the people, and I was sitting next to a family, and they there was a group of them with their kids, young kids. Um, it was it was fun, but yet you can see how serious and excited they were, and, and I really appreciate it. And I also want to give a shout out to um, Trustee Milshine. He did a really good job in speaking. Um, it was a really good speech, um, heartfelt, and uh, I learned some things from him that I didn't know before, and I'm not going to say it because <laughs> I think he needs to say it, but it was really a good program and it ran really smooth 
I mean, no hiccups, no nothing. It was like boom, 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 over. It was really good. Thank you. Trustee Hatcher? Um, uh, I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to be there because it's another one of my favorite things to do. Um, but uh, also the recognition that this is one of the best adult GED programs in the state. We have the highest graduation rate of any GED program anywhere in Michigan. Like 90 something percent. Right, mm -hmm. and um, I, that should be acknowledged. The, the other thing I wanted to bring up was that I stole one of these from the doctor's office <laughs> and now we got one in here, so. You gotta give okay. it back. So when I went to the doctor's <laughs> office and I raised this up and said, can I take it with me? Um, all I heard was wonderful things about Washington Community College. Yes. What a wonderful mm -hmm. place it is. So that's wonderful. Um, they were glad to give it to me. So I just thank you. I don't have to return it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank Trustee Fleming for attending uh, the GED graduation. Thank you so much. Well, this evening, I'd like to, uh, you've met our new Chief Human Resources Officer over dinner, but I'd like to have him stand so that I could read some things about him. <laughs> Welcome, Frank Rodriguez. He will be starting on Monday, right, officially, sort of, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Frank comes to us from the University of Michigan, where he served as Senior Labor Relations Advisor, representing management of Michigan Medicine and the University of Michigan in Labor Relations, Collective Bargaining Agreement Administration, and Contract Negotiations. Prior to U of M, he served as Human Resources Manager at Eaton Cor Corporation Aerospace Group, in Jackson, Michigan, Senior Human Resources Manager at Libby Incorporated in Toledo, Ohio, Human Resources Advan Advisor at British Petroleum in Anchorage, Alaska, Labor Relations Manager at British Petroleum Refinery in Toledo, Ohio, and Employee and Labor Relations Manager at Alcoa in Cleveland, Ohio. He holds a Juris Doctor from Wayne State University, a Master of Science in Administration Human Resources from Central Michigan University, and a Bachelor of Arts from Oakland University. Please welcome, please join me in welcoming Frank. Thank you, Frank. Did you want to say anything? You don't have to. <laughs> oh, sure. No, I'm really happy to, to be here, and I appreciate the warm welcome. I look forward to contributing to the success of Washington State College. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I do have a few other things. Um, again, the adult transition was terrific. The iron workers were here last week. That was extremely successful. I'd like to thank Brandon Tucker. Great job, Brandon. You and your team were, I can't see him, I got a box here. You were really <laughs> excellent. Very, very well done. Um, so thank you. And uh, the DT Energy EV event that was on campus. Uh, they were the star of the show last Saturday when DT Energy hosted an EV ride and drive here on campus. Uh, the WCC Transportation Technologies Department was out in force to talk about our new EV program and Future Battery Lab. Attendees got to buckle up and test drive different kinds of electric vehicles courtesy of DT. I'd like to thank all the faculty and staff that were involved in that. And then the art fair, um, it happened to be in downtown last week, as you probably know. And um, there was a large, uh, our entrepreneurship center was back again this year with Ann Arbor Spark, hosting their very popular pitch for art competition with participants doing pitches for art focused businesses. I think that's brilliant. Uh, the college all also hosted free hands-on activities for kids to enjoy, to enjoy, and they had little model cars, all focused on EV and semiconductors. So you should have been there. I know. <laughs> <laughs> the children and young at heart had the chance to make a model of the college's new EV lab using Lego kits. And they could also learn how to build circuits using Play-Doh. I think I should have went to that. That would have been a good learning environment, actually, for all of us. 
uh, WCC musicians also represented, uh, were well represented. So music faculty Steve Summers and his band, as well as the WCC Jazz Ensemble, performed on Friday and Saturday. The events were co-hosted by the college in partnership with the Amplify Project, a local nonprofit that provides resources and access to African American artists. And now I'd really like to talk to you briefly about the Community College Guarantee. Very, very briefly about it because the details have not been completely shared with us. Uh, I am really relieved and pleased to say. Um, that the governor did take into consideration the concerns that Trustee McKnight Morton and I had about the um, language that was being proposed in the um, in the community college guarantee, and our concern was that um, it was going to address. A very, it's still only going to address a slim population because it's guarant. It's a community college guarantee for tuition and fees, and um, tuition and fees, maybe books. I don't know. Not everything's been rolled out yet um, for students that come recent high school grads from the class of 23, so they're going back one year and 24. Okay, the ones that graduate in June 24. And um, it, it's going to give them, if they come full time, and they can be at any economic level now, so it doesn't have to be, this was our concern. Our concern was that it was a very, very narrow group of people. And uh, we felt that we couldn't agree. It was a good idea, but we, we felt it should be for more students. And so they did. They raised it. They she listened and they took away the limit of only being for a certain uh, economic level. So now they raised that bar so middle class families can also take advantage of that. Again, it is only for full time students. And, and who knows, maybe more will come. But as you know, right now, 76% of our students are part time. But this could be a good opportunity. It really could open up a lot of hope for students that maybe never even thought they had the possibility of doing this. So once we learn more about this, I'll share it with you. Um, but, you know, the details are being ironed out yet. So that's that's all I know. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. May I call on her? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'd just like to add on uh, to that. Um our president of MCCA um, put out a newsletter today stating that they want um, everyone to write to their representative to help pass um, the, um, what do I want to say, the, um, oh, hey, hold on, hold on. I didn't see it today. Yeah, well, it has to do, it has to do with the, um, not the Pell Grant. Oh, it, the so that part-time students can get full-time um, increase in their um, their financial aid. Because right now it's limited to the part-time students. They want we need to let the senators know that that amount of money needs to be increased. So that's what is coming out and has been out for a long time. And I haven't said anything because I was waiting on some other things like what President Polanco was saying. But this is really important. And the more that we write to your senators or your legislators, let them know this, this money is needed for these part-time students because they're the ones that's getting, uh, not getting the monies. The full-time students are, but not the part-time students. Did she include a sample letter? No, she did not. Because it would be great if, if we she could did get that. us. We right. could maybe, could you? It's the basic language. Yeah. Yes. It's the basic that language. I can send she, you right. with addresses of who, you know, with the names of our reps. Right. Reps, you know, and um, if you wouldn't mind, I could send it out to 
David, do you want to take some too uh, to your group? So that would be great. Yeah. Well, um, I'll be at the MCCA um, summer conference next week, and I'm hoping that either I can catch uh, the president or some other people and we can let her know that if she wants us to do this, we need some language. And um, so I'm hoping that that will happen. And Christina, you're going to be there too. So we need to talk. Well, and so will Bill. Bill. So we need to talk with, with her about some language. Brandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm all set. You're all set? Yes. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, we can go ahead and move on to old business, which is tab E. Honor lock remote proctoring contract. It's an action item. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees approve a three year contract with Honor Lock for online proctoring in an amount not to exceed $72,400. Do I hear a motion? Support. Any discussion? Hold on, oh. Trustee Hatcher. Um, I wasn't here for the discussion last month, um, but I'm very much concerned about spending a hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars for for a system that some of the faculty don't like and don't want. Um, it doesn't seem as though it's solving much of the problem. The problem of of access to testing and the validity of testing. Uh, you got, I think everybody got a copy uh, one way or another, if not, I have some more of, of the uh, document that um, the economics instructor wrote. Um, and I don't understand why we would go for three years for a system that some like, some don't like. Um, it seems to me one year would be good, and I understand that they wanted five, and we got it down to three. Uh, but that's you know that's a lot of money that could be spent on a testing center, which is what a lot of people want. Is, and I'm very much concerned, um, not only to the access of uh, of a testing center. I mean, Washtenaw Community College and Wayne County Community College are the only colleges that don't have an open testing center for online students. Um, and I'm very much concerned about uh, perhaps this uh, system will help um, some departments and others. I mean, some have said that they like it. Some have said that they don't like it and would never use it and it's too much work. Um, other colleges have uh, used it for a while and don't much like it anymore. So we're spending a lot of money to over $200,000 on something that doesn't solve the problem. And the main problem I'm concerned about is our reputation in four-year schools for transferability. Huh. If Calc 1 students are cheating, if Econ students are cheating, and this system is not designed to really catch them, they go on to U of M and Eastern to Calc 2 or some other class that requires Calc 1, and they don't know anything about Calc 1, and the teacher says, where did you go to school? And they say, Washtenaw Community College, and I got an A in Calc 1. So um, I can't vote for this. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't here last month to talk about it. Um, but the the faculty have suggested several pilots to work this out. These are all being rejected in favor of $272,000 for this system that some like, some don't like. May I, oh, okay, no, maybe. Well, I read the material today too, and I wondered if VP Tucker could. Uh, well, there were two. Did you read both? There is also another yes. instructor yes, I, that was attached that had a there totally were both sides different. Of it, it, it wasn't clear to me where we went, and maybe VP Tucker could help yes. sort the ticket out but here. Which material? This. But could I just clarify one thing? I oh, really, I and it was helpful to me for right. me. Different All ones. online students right. that feel uncomfortable 
with their testing online. A student that feels uncomfortable with their testing online may use the testing center. That was always the rule. And yeah, and right, Linda? Linda, was it always the rule? Um, always, but it is now. Yes. Oh, it is now. Okay, not always. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. But it is now the rule. So we did make that change where any student that it feels uncomfortable. Now, as far as, and, and that's important to us. Um, so I will let the rest, that's all I'm going to say. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, that's all I'm going to say. Is that, you. that's it. The rest is up to you guys. Thank you. Mr. Tucker. Presently, the college has a tool, Examity. Um, and Examity is widely used. Um, and our recommendation uh, last month and, of course, um, this month was that we move away from Examity because uh, the faculty and the students have not liked the experience, right? We started in 2021 in the middle of COVID. It was the best tool at that time that we were able to find. But I, I want to know that it, our usage of online proctoring is is significant, right? So Examity, um, 41 sections in the winter term use Examity, 11,237 tests were administered. Um, we piloted Otter Lock in that same semester with only two sections or two disciplines, econ and math. Um, but as you see before your documentation, there are two very different opinions, right? Um, um, econ, you know, is not happy with the tool. We've talked to that instructor even today, multiple times throughout the semester to look to see what we can do in conversations with the vendor uh, to solve for his concerns. Uh, but then on the other side, uh, from our math department, which those were our calc courses, uh, there was no cheating found. And that instructor uh, went through, uh, much like the econ instructor, uh, and that was no instances found both his sections or any of the part-timers. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, we have to have an online proctoring tool for our students. We have, um, at the, you know, request of the faculty opened up the ability for those calc, uh, courses to have some opportunities to use a testing center in person. But I want to remind us that for that single mom who's taking a math class or an econ class and after working two jobs at night has to take a test, she doesn't have the ability to come to a testing center. Now, for some of our students, they do have that ability. And even outside of our state, they have the ability to go to another testing center. But when we talk about access and we talk about our mission at the College of Access for All, we have to have multiple measures and opportunities for all students. And this, I believe, is our best solution and this is why we recommended it for approval. So how will we monitor it for three years? What's well, continuous monitoring and what we've done in the pilot phase is have regular conversations with faculty, the two faculty that were in the pilot at the time, but we would open up that to other users as we would even with Examity to find out what's working, what's not working. And that's how actually we arrived at this recommendation to move away from Examity. Because in regular conversations with faculty and our SIDO team that do a lot of the back end uh, programming to make these tools work, we found that it wasn't the greatest tool. And um, our goal is to use Honor Lock and to, of course, take the feedback that we get to make improvements. Um, and Honor Lock has been very willing and open to make those improvements as we bring them to them. Trustee Hatcher. So it will be sort of common knowledge that anyone taking an online class can use the testing center no. for their exams. Is that true? Not no. any, not any, not any class. There are certain courses that are, as we look Only at high stakes, right yep, now. yep, it's Calc 1, 2, and 3. Only calculus. Yep. Can they use the testing center? Yes. Or if there was an individual who didn't feel comfortable, um, which we've had some of those, they would have access on a case by case basis. So if I'm uh, if I'm that woman at home at night with five children and no husband and no job, um, I still have I have the choice. I don't want honor lock in my house. 
If you don't want to unlock your I house, take, you have the ability. I have on an individual basis. Individual basis, but students, we make that known that if there's any filling that an individual doesn't want a proctoring system on their computer or in their home, we have afforded them opportunity to use testing center, and that would remain. So that this is not the only device, and faculty know that. You sound. It sounds like. You have the opportunity to use the testing center, but it's hard. You got to ask special permission unless you're in calculus or something like that. I mean, do we have a dual system now or just mm -hmm. one system with exceptions? We have one system. And may I answer that? Yes. May I? Mm -hmm. We'll do it together. Yeah. Um, an online course, when a student signs up for an online course, no matter where they're at, they expect the entire experience to be online. That means, and that's how it's identified in all of our documents from three or four years ago. So they expect it to be online, fully online. That means testing online. If the student feels uncomfortable about taking honor lock and they're having honor lock have access into their home, then they may choose by speaking to their faculty member or however, they're welcome to use the testing lab. But other than that, online classes are online. Testing is online. So faculty have no input as to whether students online or with honor lock. Well, if a faculty member chooses to teach, this is in their contract. If a faculty member chooses to teach online, then we're offering classes completely online. That means testing's online. If a faculty member doesn't want to teach that way, they are very, you know, they can teach face to face. So our responsibility for, um, what shall I say? Uh, 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 honorable grades that are earned legally goes out the window because they're online classes. Well, if I may say, we have people ap applying for jobs and they went to an online university. Absolutely. So I just assume that they all, some of them cheated. I mean, I'm just saying that's a blanket, respectfully, a, I understand your concern. That That is a blanket statement to think that people online will cheat. And then my second so much easier to cheat online when you're taking a class. Yeah. Even with honor lock, unless you're taking unless you're in person taking an exam. So we can say goodbye to that guarantee that our online classes are safe and secure, and we can go with honor lock, which some faculty like, some faculty don't like, for almost $300,000 for three years. And I, I will vote against it, may thank I, you. May I answer that? Yes, yes. may I? Yes. Please, please, may I, please, please. respectfully, okay. You know, no, I mean, if faculty member respect, and I, we do, you know, academic integrity and freedom, okay. But if a faculty member feels uncomfortable about giving those types of tests, and yet they choose to teach online, maybe they should consider teaching face-to-face -face because face-to-face -face is probably the best deal you're going to get because I'm a face-to-face -face teacher and a face-to-face -face learner. So I believe that choice is still there. I also love, and this was put in place way before I came, that policy that we have where when a student, after they complete a degree, or a certificate or something, have to, we'll take a look at it again. You have a board policy. It's great. If they transfer, to, to address your concern, if they transfer to another school and they can't, I love that guarantee, and they don't do well, say, in calculus, I'm sure they will, though, because your son's a great teacher. Seriously, everyone wants him. If they don't do well, then we give them that class again. We, we stand behind, it's our faculty, we do stand behind our courses. Um, same thing, we have that guarantee. I love that guarantee. No one has it except this college. That if they go on a job and we gave them a certificate for a job and they go on this job and they don't do well on that job, 
we train them again. So I understand your concern. I respect them. And I have my mixed feelings as well because I'm a teacher and I know what I prefer. But I think that's in place as a guarantee for the quality of our instruction. I, I think that this is the best we can, you know, do. But I do understand your concern and respect it. I disagree that it's the best we can do, and I can't vote for $200,000, $300,000 for something that doesn't solve the problem. Well, that's your decision. I mean, if that's what you want to do, I that's fine, said. you know? Um, it, it, it's always all. I, um, hang on. I, I hear what you're saying, and um, I've taken online courses, and, of course, my experience does not at all am trying to convince you otherwise. I'm just saying. And I've taken online courses where I've had to take my test online, and I've had it where I could go into a testing center and take it. For me, I've had great experiences in, in both situations. Um, so it comes down to the integrity of the student. But to respectfully, but to say that switching over to honor lock and though some will like and some don't like, we understand that because you can't please everybody. But to say switching over will be the bad, be the worst thing ever, quote unquote, and I'm just paraphrasing. That does not mean that the that every student that involved that is involved in the online academic side of this institution will cheat. So that's just saying all the apple, there's a couple apples in that barrel and they're spoiled. So that means the whole barrel of apples are spoiled. That's not logic. It's just not logic. So yes, I recommend any type of avenue that will allow this student the access that they need to advance their educational career with this institution. They may just leave this institution and go somewhere else and they'll be faced with online um, testing in an honor lock or some other system. But again, to say that this is not gonna work because some of the students, some of the faculty don't like it and it's just not gonna be worth our money. I would be bold enough to say change is hard. Change is very hard. People hate their cheese being moved. You know, I mean, it's for real. They want change, but they don't want the change, which doesn't make sense. We don't know how it's gonna work unless we give it a try. If we find out after three years, you know, this was the worst thing ever, then fine, we'll change it, we'll find something else. But if this, at this point, is gonna give us the opportunity to provide the, the best possible way in accessing for our students their access to get their education moved forward so they can finish and move on, then let's give it to them. You still don't have to vote. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just uh, uh, voicing my, my opinion as well. But to shut it down because the data doesn't look right, then, you should, then you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. And we certainly don't ever want to be in that situation where we would have been like, shoulda, woulda, coulda, because it would have worked had we given it a shot. So that's that's my opinion. Trustee Devani. Trustee Devani. Uh, yeah, so I, I just read this um, at the meeting here. I'm a guest. Otter Lock failed to identify 22 of 26, 84% cases of academic misconduct identified by the lead instructor. This is in the econ mm -hmm. report. And then in terms of their low flag, failed to identify 21 of, 20, of the 26 cases of academic misconduct identified. By, so it even, I mean, both flags failed to identify this misconduct. So to me, it raises the question, 
And I'm also, I just want to say, U of M students taking our econ classes cheat more than non-U of M students, according to this. That's an opinion. Okay, it's an opinion. Okay, so I shouldn't say that as a fact. <laughs> That's an opinion. It's an opinion of the instructor. Correct. Who was looking at this, who admitted, who gave the test and was looking at this thing and then identified felt like they were identifying academic misconduct on the part of some of the students taking the test. Um, but we have, right now we teach classes online. We give tests online. We have to have some way of proctoring those tests. I think right now we use Examity. You said over 11,000 tests were done through Examity. How much money do we pay for Examity per year? Examity has a ceiling of 75,000. Um, so those 11,237 tests that we administer um, does have some limits. So our current Examity, because of the cost, um, does not allow, which is one reason why both faculty and students don't like it, uh, what we will call a Cadillac version of proctoring. It's a very base level proctoring. But then uh, because of the cost, there's two tests per section that faculty could use kind of the AI or it'll come into the classroom to say, hey, something's going on. So what we're getting in OtterLock as a base product in Examity is a premium product that is limited based upon cost. So we're not getting a comparable product from Examity and we're paying $75,000 a year for it. Correct. So this contract will deliver a better proctoring product. A bettering tool in our, that and, doubles the amount of access. So given that we have to do something, and if Examity isn't the answer, for me, the question is, I mean, I'm aghast at this report, and I want us to do better than what what I'm seeing. I have we Do we have any sort of comparable look at how Examity identifies or flags academic misconduct? Um, have yes. we seen any of that? One would say that it is not as comprehensive because it's a lower level of proctoring. You only get the higher level for the two tests. I will say that on face value, when you look at the one um, disciplines assessment, um, that is not substantiated by actual failures, of course. Okay. So when you see that 84% of misconduct was found, that was that individual's assessment of what misconduct was. It could be an eye fluttering. It could be looking down and looking up. It could be looking to the side and looking back at the screen. But it did not result in 84% of those students being failed in the course. Well, so that's where it becomes that, very it, murky waters. Well, if, the, if you're an effective cheater, you're less likely to fail. Right? So, I, you know, it doesn't matter what you're telling me right now hmm. because – the failure rate in the course isn't evidence of whether the proctoring is successful or, or if it's catching people cheating or not, because cheaters can get away with passing classes uh, and it, that's fine. You know, it's, it's only hurts them in the long run. And that's why individual integrity is key on the part of the students coming into this. Um, I'm, despite my significant <clears throat> concerns from this report from the econ department, I'm willing to give this a shot because we have to do something. And if in, if in your and, um, estimation, the, the math faculty person who weighs in here seems to s think more highly of the capabilities of honor lock. I'm I'm willing to give it a shot, but I want us to uh, really keep an eye on it. And at the same time, are there ways we can look at other possible proctoring systems, which may be better 
um, and superior to this. Um, is there a way that are, do we have to buy in for three years on this? Most of the tools want a longer term commitment. Uh, the original quote to us was five years. We were able to go back to the vendor and ask for three instead of five. Um, it becomes utility of effort when you think about less than three, um, because if it's, for example, a year or two, then that's really not enough time to assess the tool. And then if the tool is not working, work with that vendor to be able to say, hey, can you improve the tool? And then if they can't improve it, then go out and, and competitively bid a new tool and integrate the tool, right? So that's why the three years has been recommended. Um, I will say that it is a uh, what we would consider an add-on to Canvas. So um, with our learning management system, it's not like we're buying an entire Canvas that it would be wild and crazy to try to get out of it. It is a tool that we can have the time to utilize, try to get its greatest utility, and then if tweaks need to be made in the future, um, it is a, a add, what we would call an add-on to the LMS. Now, I have... Um, a can I continue to follow oh, on? My apologies. We'll go right ahead. Um, so I, I want to go in. I'm still doing the comparison. We, we need something. We're paying $75,000 a year now. This is a contract for three years for $90,000 a year. Um, not that much more. I'm looking for the benefits or the reasons to switch to this. And if it, if there are improvements, it sounds like it's a better product. We have, and we have mixed reviews from the two trial faculty members. Uh, the one thing that's encouraging to me is it seems from the letters from the math instructor that there's some engagement with honor lock that can make improvements and address problems as they're found. Is that something that is the as the administrator that you're finding and that you can it attest is. to that it is that's, a, that we're getting on the part of the vendor for this versus for examity? Are we getting a more uh, more robust support for addressing problems because to me that's worth fifteen thousand dollars a year i would say that we're getting access for that support uh, i know that uh, that faculty member has been very engaged with honor lock um, and i know he still has some concerns and there's some, still some things that we want to solve um, but in terms of a willingness from the vendor to hear not just the administrator, but hearing the faculty. I mean, he's been talking to them, I think every other week probably, and has developed a work relationship with our account success rep um, where he reaches out directly. So there is access and it's not, you know, in a box, it's um, faculty to that person or, or SIDO team for online. So yes, um, in short, still a ways to go. <laughs> He still wants to see some things, and we talked about that even today, um, but he has had access to that team and continues to work with them. Well, that's reassuring. Yeah. Thank, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. And one thing to kind of follow up, we're also, you know, should this be approved, um, it would be something that our CIDO team that works with our LMS will have additional training so that they can triage some issues as well uh, on ground so that we're not always having to call the, you know, help support center to um, support, you know, issues that happen. Trustee Hatcher? Um, regardless of whether we do this or not, um, I think it would be important for the college to begin to study this whole question because artificial intelligence is coming yes. right down the pike. Um, and we need to be able to address that in our classroom and in our teaching as well. We so the whole question of um, ex examinations, uh, uh, the word, I can't remember the word, authentic testing, uh, especially in view of AI, is something that somebody ought to be looking at um, beyond just what package we need to buy next. Absolutely. Um, it's a systemic problem, and it's going to affect all the classes uh, in one way or another. Absolutely. Yeah. Peter, go ahead. Um, I'm glad you mentioned that. And actually, Ellie and I, talked about a joint um, committee of some sort, task force, where we would do just that. 
And I'm thinking faculty focusing on what works best for the classroom, what works best for instruction. I mean, we need to learn a lot and have some input on that. You're so right. And administratively, we need to learn about AI and what we need to do about it and how to work with it. So um, I will be sharing with her, the two of us are going to agree on a process that we're going to use um, to look at AI. And I think we talked about it too when you were in that meeting, right, Dave? I remember that little group we went to lunch? Yeah, um, but you're right, you're so right. It's, yeah, we have to look at that and see how we can use it effectively, see how we have to be worried about it. I mean, understand the whole thing. And um, you're right. Yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. but I'm a little short-sighted, a little short-handed here because I don't teach online. I'm a face-to-face -face teacher, but I talk to a lot of faculty and colleagues who do teach online. And so when I taught online, COVID was a necessity. We all went online and it was striking. Um, I had an eight to 10% increase in all of my exams across the board and all my classes just from putting them online. And that's just that cheat factor. When you talk to online faculty who teach online, it is a concession that they all understand that there is no good way to test online. I, I challenge anyone right now to simply go on your phone, your computer and look up on YouTube how to cheat on Examity and you will find hundreds of videos on how to do it. If you say how to cheat on Honor Lock, you will find thousands of videos on how to cheat on Honor Lock. Um, I don't know what the solution is here. I don't teach online and I don't think there is a reliable 100% product out there. It is about student integrity. It is about how an instructor organizes a class and how they weight those exams that might be inflated by cheating. And as you stated, on one side we have poor online testing and on the other side we have chat GPT and AI. So to say, well, don't give multiple choice, give them essays. We're, we're getting pinched on both sides and faculty are feeling it because students coming into Calc 2 got A's in Calc 1 online and they cannot so much as do an equation in Calc 2. And this is frustrating. I do want to point out, though, that there is one thing going on that I'm hearing more and more from colleagues, and that is we have programs and courses here that are entirely online. And so the option that I myself say to my colleagues all the time, I just, the economics faculty member, Greg Heidelbrink is back there. Um, and it, is, uh, it has been very restrained during the conversation. I wanna give him credit. Um, but my advice to my colleagues is always, they just come teach face to face, problem solve. But they teach in programs that are entirely online and there is no face to face option. So certain faculty here, I don't know what the number is, but there are faculty that want to come back to campus and teach face-to-face -face classes and cannot because their courses don't fill and their programs are online entirely. And so there is a cost to them being in sometimes an inability. And I just don't want to have to be overlooked because just come back and teach in a classroom is not an option for everybody. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah. I just, will look into that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Trustee Milshine, you're going to pass to her. Okay, it'll be um, Trustee uh, Milligan. Is, is uh, Honor Lock a domestic vendor? It is. Like in the United States? Yeah. Yes. And and, and with, uh, with their agreement to continue to work with this, if we pass this on a consulting basis, I think that that's reassuring, and I'd be comfortable voting in favor of this. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Fleming. Yeah, just one point I wanted to remind um, everybody here of is that with our online programs, we have registered students in just about every single state of the country now. We have at least a couple dozen out of California. We've got some in Texas. I think we even have some in Toronto and China. So coming to the Texas Testing Center is absolutely not feasible for some of our online students. And so we absolutely have to try out online proctoring systems. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about online proctoring systems to know who's the best of the best. I don't know. So it is going to be a matter of trial and error and figuring it out. But just remember, we've got students coming in from Texas they and California. Testing, they have testing. Not, it's not feasible for everybody. We got, how about China and Toronto? What, yes, what's in China? Exactly. You know? exactly. So we have to look at the whole picture. We got to look at everybody. Have to look at the whole picture. 
So I just pulled up this article because I remember reading it uh, a couple months ago. Um, the University of Michigan uh, uh, announced or made it public that more than 74% of their students have received A's or A minuses, which is considerably more than in any years past where it used to be in the 50s. Um, so I don't think we're the only ones dealing with this problem. Um, I think this is a across the board issue. Um, but here's where my concern lies. I do understand, I, I, I do have concerns about signing a long-term contract. Um, even, you know, three years to me is a long-term contract. And the reason for that is, you know, we've talked about AI. AI a year ago was not what it is today. And look how quickly my my work has changed by AI, my productivity has changed by AI, my efficiency, everything has changed because now I have ChatGPT and I'm able to write emails much quicker. I'm able to do a lot of my work a lot more efficiently, um, including editing photos and things that I used to not be able to do because I had a copy editor that I had to work with, a graphic designer. Now my life has become a whole lot easier just in 12 months. And so my concern lies is that we're signing a three-year contract, which we need to, in my opinion, we need to sign, I shouldn't say we need to sign a contract. I'm not saying that we need to sign a three-year contract um, because we do need to offer, you know, if somebody agrees to take a, a um, an online class, we're offering an online class, we should offer an, a full online ex experience for them. Um, and I'm glad that we're offering the option. If you're not comfortable doing an online uh, exam, you're able to come to campus. Um, where my issue lies is that in a year from now or in a year and a half from now, there's going to be a different platform Definitely. that's going to be a whole lot more efficient and something that's going to be a lot better um, just because I'm sure somebody's watching this on YouTube at some point and they're probably not watching just us. They're watching the U of M Board of Regents. They're watching the various uh, bodies across the country and they're currently trying to figure out how can we solve this problem? And so I'm assuming there is a company out there that's currently working on this. Um, I would feel a whole lot comfortable is if this sort of a contract had some sort of an escape clause for us. Mm -hmm. So if after 12 months, you know, let's just say we give them a base 12 months, after 12 months, we have an escape clause where we can get out of the contract because there's some sort of a super duper program that comes out in the next 12 months um, or 18 months or two years um, that we're able to switch to that. Um, so I would feel more comfortable with having an opportunity for us to escape this contract, realizing that it will, even if something super comes out, it's going to take some time. Um, maybe that clause is already in the contract. Uh, maybe it's not, and we can work with our counsel to put that in there. But I would feel a lot more comfortable uh, voting in favor of this if we had some sort of a clause. And also, I would feel a lot more comfortable proving this, knowing that the faculty are going to communicate with the administration and the administration will communicate with mm -hmm. us that we are able to, uh, if there's something great out there, that we're able to move quickly to implement that and to make our online experience better. And also to make sure that our students who are transferring or entering the workforce are the best they can possibly be. Thank you. So is it in our idea. contract? I know that majority of our contracts do have an out clause. I don't know what the terms are of that out clause, but we can ensure that there is an out clause and we can solve for that. I, I don't want to put Ben on the spot because I'm not sure that he has well, that data. How about but... maybe Larry, can you help us figure out how to say this? You're talking about a, a provision we can get out without cause. Yeah, I don't know if that's in this contract. You could buy your way out. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I mean, it'll cost more, but we can go for, for a provision such as that. Well, I, we, I would feel comfortable having some sort of a provision that allows us the opportunity. I would too. Yeah, based I on whatever too. our um, our data yeah. feedback lets us know about. So uh, you had something you want to say? I'm fine because it would, uh, Trustee just said okay. what I was going to say. Okay, Trustee Devine. I do want to point out that this contract is only $15,000 more than we're paying now so the way i'm evaluating it is by looking at what we're buying as improvements for that fifteen thousand. and if examity if we re-signed with them 
there's going to be a, a long-term contract as well, pretty much whoever we signed with. So I, I think we're buying more than $15,000 of value in terms of their willingness and ability to work with us to make modifications. So to me, it's worth it. We need something. And it's worth that little bit of extra, the $15,000 extra, more than we're already paying for Examity. Um, so I will vote for this with that proviso, but I do have significant concerns raised by the faculty, the econ faculty member who did the visual review of it. Absolutely. So it's, I, I'm going to vote for this, but I'm going to keep a close eye on it as a member of the board. Absolutely. Well, how would that vote be crafted? So we do exactly, how would that statement be crafted to do exactly what you want without going into a three-year contract? You know, I don't want to do, I, I think this vote. conversation's outstanding and I agree. Not that it matters, but I do. Uh, <laughs> if we approve this contract, if we approve this, I feel like we're giving the administration the authority to enter into a contract. That allows you, with Lair, with our council's advice, to craft a contract up to a certain amount of money that hopefully gives us a way to buy our way out. You know, and I would expect that the they're going to say, well, yeah, if you leave after a year, it's going to cost X. Right. Um, and if that's part of the contract, great. It gives us a way out. If there's some great right. product out there, we can mm -hmm. pay something to get out of this contract to go to a different contract. But I, if we approve this, I believe, Larry, correct me if we're wrong, if I'm wrong, that we're, are we approving a specific contract or are we giving you the authority to, um, to, do, to approve? To, we could do up to three years, maximum 272.4. Wait. So if the contract with an escape clause, well, it, well, you don't have to say that. That's up. Yeah, that gives you the administration. We, we, of, yeah, we just can't spend more than two seventy two four. No, but one thing I want to make sure, I, you know, I want to be transparent. I want to make sure we we wouldn't, but I want to make sure we don't go three years if we don't if it's not the right thing to do. That's all. So, does that give us? If we change the language to read. You know what I mean? Escape of, for cause. Yeah. That the Board of Trustees yeah. approves up to a three year contract with Hunter Lock for online proctoring in the amount of 2724. If it costs more to get the out within three years, it would still have to be within the 2724. They might not even want it for three years because if it's not going to work That's after why one year. To. That's why we read up to. Oh, because if it works, then we'll have it. Okay. You know, I'm just trying to figure it out. So, fine. Um, is has have we made a motion yet with this? No. Um, okay. So we are going to move with the amended part of the recommendation, we, or are we, we going we with amend, what it says here? Amend the recommendation to change the language to read up to three years. Well, we could just make the motion. In fact, I'll make the motion. I move that the Board of Trustees approve up to a three-year contract with Honor Lock for online proctoring in an amount not to exceed $272,400. I support. Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Davis? Yes. Vice Chair Milligan? Yes. yes. Treasurer DeVardy? DeVardy, yes. Trust Secretary Hatcher? Hatcher? Sorry. Stay. Trustee Fleming? Yes. yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? Yes. Trustee Milstein? Yes. Yeah, I'm going to really pay a lot of attention to that one because I want to make sure everyone does the right thing. I know they will, but you know, people get busy. So I want to make sure that this one's on our forefront because uh, it's important that we follow through on this commitment. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, yes go ahead. Um, I think with what's happening in the world of AI, I think it is incredibly important that we get that committee up and running. So I would hope that the faculty and Dr. Blanca put the committee together because it's rampant of, um, you know, I'm, I've been reading lots of articles about, you know, ChatGPT and other um, 
AI uh, writing papers for students. So I think we we need to really get on top of this and make sure um, that uh, our faculty have the resources to be able to decipher whether a paper was written by AI or by a student. Um, I think we really need to be on top of this because that is this this discussion may be a completely moot point um, um, in this upcoming semester and in the future uh, because of what's happening. So I think we need to really jump on that. So I hope that as soon as faculty is back on campus, that we can form the committee um, and really get a recommendation. I know there's also lots of software um, and SAS um, out there that can assist us uh, with that um, to make sure that our students are getting the best education possible. Thank you for that recommendation. Okay, hey, moving on to tab F, the electric vehicle battery lab project. The recommendation is that the Board of Trustees establish on an electric vehicle testing lab capital project in the amount not to exceed $1 million. Do I hear a motion? Board. Any discussion? Vanessa, please call the roll. Chair Davis? Yes. Vice Chair Milliken? Yes. Treasurer DeVarty? DeVarty, yes. Secretary Hatcher? Yes. Trustee Fleming? Yes. yes. Trustee McKnight Morton? Yes. Trustee Mill? Yes. Thank you. Moving on to the uh, discussion item for tab G, proposed changes to Board of Trustee policy 4055 policy on new student assessment and individualized program planning. Professor Linda, uh, Provost, excuse me, Linda Brakey. Uh, good evening. Uh, policy 4055 was last changed in 2003. So certainly there's been a lot of things that have happened since then. So we'll kind of go over that. So just some background. Remember that Washington Community College, um, we're an open door institution. And so what does that mean? It means that when students either graduate from high school, earn a GED, reach 18 years of age, or are dual enrolled in high school with permission of their parent in school, they can be admitted to Washtenaw. We have prescribed course requirements for all of our courses. So faculty departments through the curriculum approval process determine the academic requirements for each of our courses. Uh, the vast majority of our courses require uh, college level in reading and writing. We have all of our levels defined as three to four to six. So level six is college level in reading and writing. Math courses or math-based courses um, also can have a required math level. Um, level three and higher is considered college level. And we also have a handful of courses that are designated as no basic skills, for instance, some music and art classes. So again, all the courses have as part of the process, determined levels. So policy 4055 basically describes how the college assesses the academic readiness of our incoming students. It also includes exemptions for the assessment process, such as guest students or where a student has earned college credits at a prior institution. So again, the, the policy talks about how we're committed to meeting the student basically where, where they are. Um, we're again providing open access um, for our students. And so I'm gonna go through and um, show where we're recommending changes. So the process talks about the student, um, students coming in and taking cl credit classes for the first time. will receive an orientation process and a basic skills assessment. Um, but we're not limiting that to a, a testing component. So the student may also provide um, a high school transcript and demonstrate their basic skills competency based on a cumulative grade point average. So again, that's been expanded to just beyond just test scores. The other thing we're doing is instead of just referring again to testing, we're talking about the basic skills assessment could also include um, where the student has earned college credits from an English speaking university. Um, where they've gotten 15 or more credits with a 2.0. Um, we're also looking at before the policy indicated that welding was just a class that you took for fun that did not require basic skills. And of course, we know that welding is a very technical course. And so that's been removed as a kind of an enrichment course. But we have left courses like music and art as those kind of um, enrichment courses. 
We had a separate provision that said if the student had a bachelor's degree from an English-speaking university, um, that's been removed because we're addressing that um, with the adjustment in A, where basically the student has 15 college credits from an English-speaking college or university, um, they're exempt from that basic skills assessment. We also mentioned in our prior policy that um, students who um, were um, apprentices from General Motors, Chrysler, Visteon, um, they were exempt from the assessment process. Of course, some of these companies are no longer in existence. So it's been updated to indicate um, individuals who are enrolled in a contract training course or program would be exempt from the assessment process. Because generally for apprentices, and students in those programs, they've already had their internal assessment for the program that they're going to be taking. We also, for students who are guest students who are coming and taking classes with us, if they've been admitted at a generally a four-year institution and they're coming in as a guest student and they're in good standing at their institution, they also meet our admission criteria and are no longer don't need the assessment process when they come in. Again, it, the policy notes that certainly students who are um, learning disabled that will provide ADA accommodations um, when they are having their assessment completed. We also note that students who have a cumulative GPA of less than 2.0, um, are, we are seeing advisors to um, de determine kind of course recommendations and or credit restrictions moving forward. And we also note that um, the student's academic readiness will always be um, if they're needing academic readiness, they will be counseled into um, co-requisite reading, writing, and math courses um, to meet their placement standards. We also talk about um, that um, the minimum standards, the, the cut scores that we use for any of the tests are done in the academic areas, and that students who do not meet those um, cut scores or they have the levels that they need will be advised into co-requisite reading, writing, and math courses. And then um, students can, based on the um, faculty area, based on the instructional area, can take a co-requisite course along with courses in the area. And that, the again, our assessment policy and our placement practices will always be structured to meet learners where they are in the individual program that they're in. So again, this policy was originally adopted in 1987 and revised in 2003. So this is the first reading of the changes that are being proposed. Who's first? Oh, Trustee Devardi. <laughs> Trustee Devardi. <laughs> a, a couple questions. Um, first of all, on these sorts of policies, it's required that we have two readings, so we don't, we can't just pass it the first time. But I, I do take note that with the change with co-requisite, that with that, if we keep the, I mean, it seems like with fall coming and we're not having an August meeting, that maybe that's a change we want to make as soon as possible. Um, but I guess we can't so we, make it until September at the best. So we have co-requisite courses now. Um, so some of these changes have been in place for a while. Um, but um, the policy hadn't been updated for a while, so but we've had co-requisites. But this prior isn't going to gonna impact students wanting to come in that we haven't changed the policy yet. No. Okay. Thank it you. will not. No, it will not impact the students coming in for fall. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Trustee Hatcher. So uh, the co-requisites are in place of what we used to call basic skills assessment. In other words, if I come into the college. I graduated from high school um, and my reading level is four instead of six, mm -hmm. or my math level is four instead of six, or my writing level is four instead of six. Are there courses for me to take, basic skills courses? Yes. What are they? Uh, we have ACS 107, ACS 108. That's reading. Um, those are both, right, so those are reading. Mm -hmm. And then we also have um, English 075. Which is writing. Which is writing. It's a common, actually, English 075 is a combination of reading and writing put mm -hmm. together. Okay. And we have English 090 and 91, but we are moving away to having students taking co-requisite courses with their English 111 course or English 107 course. Moving away from, say that again? Moving away from having standalone, like English 091, to having a co-requisite with the with the college level course. Okay, so the whole basic skills thing has changed. 
It's a co-requisite basic skills model, yes. Uh, Trustee Mills, oh, I'm sorry, I go just, ahead. I, I would just like to, uh, if anybody's interested, I have copies of 1050, the mission statement of the college that lists developmental education, offering basic courses which strengthen reading, writing, and math, computer, and study skills. Um, it seems as though we're moving away from that, and we might want to include this in terms of a, um, it hadn't been revised since 2009, maybe it needs to be revised again. Our mission statement, 1050, if anybody. So is this different than what Trustee Hatcher just identified? No, it's, it's a different from her thing, I'm just talking about revising um, board policy um, because what we're hearing is that there aren't going to be um, a whole sort of developmental education model. It's going to change. And I think we need to change the mission statement to reflect that. That's all I'm saying. Right, but we'll still have courses. The students will still be able to, the students who are not at college level will still be able to access the courses, but with co-requisites instead of standalone developmental courses. Right. So there's there's not a developmental education program. Right, the co it's that a, language. That's so cool. we have to change. So you're saying this has to be changed. Yeah, I'm just okay. offering this to okay. change. Right. Cool. Thank you. That that they that's good information. Appreciate appreciate that a lot. Anyone else? Trustee Milshine. Um, so question in regards to why the change with regards to um in two A um students who have previously earned a college degree from an English speaking college or university. What why? What, what caused that change? Or what, why are we, why is this being recommended? I'm sorry, but so why are we recommending that? So it's basically we had, um, it's instead of just, it's not just anybody who comes in with a degree. So students who are coming in with 15 credits, if they've already earned 15 credits at a English speaking university with a 2.0 or better, then they're exempt from taking the assessment process with us. Why the English speaking part? The question. Uh, because if they were, if they came in and they were uh, take had taken fifteen credits at a, a Spanish speaking university, then that doesn't change that they need to have do an assessment so that we know that they're ready to take classes with us. So I'm. And we change it to an English speaking. It used to say like a U.S. college or university. What, but we indicate, we know that students could be graduating from schools in England, they could be graduating from schools in Canada, and so they've been taught in English, and so that assessment or their earning of those 15 credits indicates that they're ready to take college classes with us, as opposed to taking, having taken 15 credits at a, a university that's not English speaking. So... I'm thinking for an example of a family that's moving here next semester. Mm -hmm. um, they are um, parents are English speaking. They're here from the U.S. They work for one of the automotive companies. Okay, move their family to India. Um, kids are college uh, one to two years done in college. They're coming back here, and I made a recommendation that they come to WCC. Okay. So to me, they're, they're not an English speaking university at this point. Can they speak English? Well, in India, they speak English. Mm -hmm. but, but that's my, that's my question is what is an English speaking college or university? So it's a college or university that the curriculum is provided in English. So in that example, it is not provided in English. So even though that's the the household spoken language, I, I'm so where I'm getting at this is that I feel like I don't know if that's the for me it's the right language of what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay. Um, just because it doesn't, you know, there are, for example, in Europe, you know, kids are coming from all over Europe. Mm -hmm. English is usually a commonly spoken language amongst them, even though they're coming from different countries across Europe. 
um, and that English is their first language, but their instruction that they're receiving currently is not in English. And I'm talking about a very small portion of our students, mm -hmm. but That's what I, I guess I'm having a hard time uh, agreeing that this is the right language for this, okay? So I don't know what the right language is, but I'm having a hard time there. Okay. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is uh, moving on to to uh, B, and that is, for example, some music or art courses. Yes. Um, those are examples. Those are examples. Uh, who makes the determination? The department does. The department. So does. when the department is part of the curriculum development process, every course that goes through the curriculum development process, the faculty in the department that are putting that class through determine what the academic levels are for to access that course. So how about we just remove, for example, some music or art okay. courses? Well, because it's not all music and it's not all art. Well, I'm saying we just remove, for it's example, cool. some, and we just let the departments make the decision altogether. Just so that there's very little confusion that it is some, only some uh, music and only some art courses. As as they can do by yeah. Are you nitpicking? I, I am. I'm sorry to be nitpicking. Yes, you but, you know, this is also a board policy, so I, I, I want to nitpick this a little bit. Okay. Once again, it's just that that language. Um, since the departments have the have the authority to make the decision, then why don't we just end with basic skills proficiency and put a period on that just okay. a suggestion okay um just some feedback um thank you um do you have a suggestion about the english speaking because that came up in our discussion as well and we didn't have one i mean there was a question we had as well coming from an english speaking and someone gave a similar example so no, I, you know, yes, maybe you do. I'm sorry. Well, I'm um, I think no. y you can you can talk about what she said, where instruction is primarily in English. Mm. But I know that, for instance, in Budapest, this language at home is Hungarian, but the university language is all English. So you'd get a student here who doesn't speak English very well, but all their instruction had been in English but their English language proficiency is probably not very good. So that's the opposite issue. Yeah. Um, but if you, I think you should say something about courses offered in English. Hmm. Is there some opportunity to add language in here? Or um, isn't there an exam that students have to take that? Uh, well, yeah, is there this some? Has, this has nothing to do with that. Okay. So you're talking about admission. So F1 students do have mm -hmm. to take a TOEFL exam. So so students who are coming in, no matter what kind of what their training has been in, have to take test of English as a of a foreign test of English as a foreign language, and they have to have minimum scores on that. That is separate from this. That's their, to actually be admitted as an F1 student. So this is not talking about how we're going to admit students. This is only talking about how we assess students' levels to access our courses. It's separate from our admission process. Trustee Devardi? So the way I read this is these are just um, examples of that would be exempt from taking a basic skills assessment. Correct. And how complicated is this basic skills assessment? So if somebody came in who was a graduate of the University of Barcelona, mm -hmm. Spanish-speaking uh, university, and said they wanted to take some classes here, mm -hmm. and their classes required some proficiency in English, maybe an English lit class or something, what would they have to do to demonstrate? They could take, um, they would come in and they could uh, either do a writing sample Okay. Or they could also do uh, take our AccuPlacer, which is reading and writing. It's untested. It's untimed. So it goes through and does a reading assessment and a writing assessment and determines the student's level. And that test is free, available in our testing center. And how long does it take? How complicated? It takes is about it? 45 minutes for each section. So somebody could... They can do could... the writing sample, which takes about half, 20 minutes. So somebody could spend a couple hours and 
meet the needs if they came, yes. if they came in. Correct. Okay, that's fine for me. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, we'll come back for the second reading and talk again. Chair, Chair Davis, yes. just to clarify, under uh, policy 1030 policy development guidelines, the board could vote next meeting to adopt this. Okay. It would, it would okay. be allowed. We wouldn't be required to do two more meetings. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. But thank we will come back. Thank with you for suggestion if there is one. I mean, you know, we'll work on it. I think that's good. But I think my my hearing of this, um, and I, I understand what you're saying, uh, Trustee, but um, I think from we're just concerned about the students being able to mm -hmm. do read and write our language. Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Okay. So, so what I'm looking at is here, and that's just what they're saying. You could have come from a different place as long as you can do our reading and writing, whatever that is. Because I'm, 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 not, I'm still yeah. not sure what you were trying to get to with this. Yes, and so I, I agree. And there are students who are taking courses in other countries sure. at universities where their instruction is in Spanish, but they are very fluent in English. <clears throat> but their instruction was mm -hmm. in Spanish. Okay. Trustee Miller. Okay. Students who have previously earned a college degree and have an English language proficiency level of and, and the Foreign Service has some classifications of foreign language proficiency. English is a foreign language, uh, but uh, quantify that and have an English language speaking proficiency of some level that we did, we deem acceptable. How about that? Doesn't that say where you're trying to go? Yeah. Provost, very politely. Did you yes, hear well, me? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we will make those adjustments. We'll figure out some language that makes everyone happy. Appreciate it. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to the last tab of the evening, tab H, electrical infrastructure upgrade for fleet EV charging, AVP whip stock. Uh, good evening. I'd like to review with you the Washtenaw Community College's electric vehicle uh, deployment plan. Uh, this plan uh, goes through um, and puts EV charging stations campus-wide. The plan goes through to the end of 2025 where we plan on having 38 total public vehicle charging stations and 15 total fleet charging stations. Now, the fleet, I want to make sure that everybody, is not just for um, WCC cars and vehicles. This also includes lawn equipment, high lows, everything. So we don't have 15 cars as of yet. So that includes lawn equipment and everything. Uh, this plan would give us, um, like I said, 38 uh, public uh, vehicle charging stations, which would include the 12 existing charging stations in the garage. We're adding eight fleet vehicle charging stations in the garage. Um, they're actually being installed as of right now. Uh, the Morris Lawrence building would have seven uh, new public vehicle charging stations installed. The Health and Fitness Center, uh, which is currently, um, they're being installed actually this week. Uh, seven new charging stations there. Uh, lots six and seven, we would be adding eight public charging stations. Uh, the Student Center, we would add four charging stations public to it. And the Shipping and Receiving Building, that would be installing seven fleet vehicle charging stations. Where are we at? Okay, in 24, like I said, we are actually installing, uh, as of this week, 
um, eight charging or fleet charging stations in the uh, parking garage. The Morris Lawrence building, the design was uh, completed. The RFP was written and it's actually out for uh, bids as of right now to get costs. Health and Fitness Center, uh, that's underway. We're installing the charging stations again this week. Coming in 2025, lot six and seven, uh, which most of the infrastructure had already been there. We actually put it in about two years ago when we had to change the uh, transformer that was out there. At that time, we, we felt that we would be putting charging. So we increased the size of that transformer and put the infrastructure in at that time. So it is just basically adding the charging stations to that area. So we put that under in the RFP under the MLB project, which uh, we'll be bringing forward uh, hopefully in the coming months. Student Center, we haven't started the design of that yet. Uh, the shipping and receiving building, which we will be presenting to the board, uh, the seven new fleet EV chargers that will be going in. The total infrastructure cost through 2025, which falls under the green fund, would be about $1.1 million. Now, one of the things I didn't add to this is the DTE rebates. Um, Health and Fitness Center, MLB, and the Shipping Receiving Building are um, will be uh, will have about thirty-two thousand dollars each of those uh, projects would be getting thirty-two thousand dollars back in rebates for those. Any questions so far on this? Trustee McKnight, Morton. Um, do you know the total number of EVs that's going to be? Um, you know, for the campus, <coughs> the total number? Total number through 25 would be the 38 that I had mentioned. So, so it's 38 total. Well, yeah, let me, I'll explain a little bit more. The infrastructure that we're putting in will accommodate far more than the 38. As as I go on, I'll explain that as well. Okay. If you give me. Okay. All right. Coming slide is the installed infrastructure that we're putting in, the infrastructure, the wiring, the transformers, will allow us to expand on that, meaning we'll be able to almost double the capacity of what we're installing now. So the additional capacity will be another 38 and another eight EV vehicles. So that's the design capacity that we're installing currently. So at the end, if and if and we need to, we have to install more under the current design, we would be able to charge 99 vehicles throughout the campus. But that's only if and when we need we to. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Um, that sounds great. But I'm going to switch gears here for a second, okay. if you don't mind. What is their background experience in putting in these chargers? What is my background? Because I've been looking at this and I haven't seen their experience. So their experience Harper, or his experience? I, I'm talking about EVs. Um, Harper, I know about Harper Electric. I'm saying their experience in installing EV chargers. Who the company that we've yes. we've hired? Yes, right. Um, well, it's been two. Uh, different companies. It's been Huron Valley and Harper who um, actually got the won the bid on the yeah, RFP. Right. Harper Electric, um, when we had a, uh, when the RFPs came back, we questioned their number. So we brought them in for a design review. So we brought in Don Harris uh, from purchasing, myself, we brought PBA in uh, who did the design and we all sat down with Harper to go through the design to make sure they had everything in it. What Harper came back has been doing a huge amount of EV installs for University of Michigan, city of Ann Arbor. So most of their work for the last two years, based on what they told us, has been the installation of EV chargers. 
and they're an authorized installer for ChargePoint. So they have a pretty big background. In That's good to hear because there's a lot of word out here that some electric uh, chargers are not working. They're installed, but they still don't work. Right. One of the things that uh, we make our vendors do, they have to pull the permits from the city for electrical inspections and the safety checks. So we actually just had a visit from the inspector today in the garage to make sure the installation was going as designed. That's great. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Sure. Um, do you have any, uh, do you know if they have any minorities that work with them? Any subcontractors or something like that? Uh, I have no down here. I don't know yeah, offhand. I, uh, I know uh, Huron, Va our Huron Valley is a subsidiary of Motor City Electric, which I think is minority owned, I think. Um, but nothing local Do you know? You don't know. From what I'm hearing, you don't know. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but I do know that Huron Valley is a um, yeah. is a subsidiary of Motor City Electric. Right, right. Is there any way that you uh, could inform us if they if there are any? Because I really would like to know that. Yeah, I could. Yeah, I okay. could find out. Uh, I can get that information from Don Harrising and purchasing. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I see Hatcher. Um, so I can't even get my new phone to work, but. Uh, am I correct in seeing that this uh, uh, 243000 is for the infrastructure mm -hmm. to prepare for the stations? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. I'm just going to okay. sure, uh, trustee Milligan. Harper Electric has got a very good uh, commercial contractor reputation in the county. I well known. Yeah. I, I was just talking specifically about the EVs. Earlier on, you sounded skeptical. Uh, their name is yeah. known and, and they're respected. Yeah, maybe it's the way I, I started out. I'm sorry. A question with regard to the charging. Uh, I know them by level one, level two, level three charging. Can you quantify what level charging will be available? So that was part. He was going to go on and explain these. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> we had it's a, all right. No, I can no, answer. <laughs> <laughs> so the majority of what we're installing are level twos. We are putting one fast charger at the health and fitness center, one at the ML building, and one at the shipping and receiving building. So we, we will only have by design three DC chargers on campus. Uh, the thought process was if you think of going to the health and fitness center, most people are coming within a 25 mile radius. They're probably there for an hour, an hour and a half. If you plug into a level two charger for an hour, you got your mileage right back. So the higher cost of the uh, DC charger wouldn't be beneficial to the customer. Anyone else? Uh, Trustee Devardi. So this 243,000, that's not the chargers. That's just that's the, not uh, yeah. That's just the infrastructure. And on top of that, we'll have we'll see uh, in the future something to say x amount of dollars for the charging yeah. Well, the board charging stations back with uh, was it several couple months ago authorized uh, the contract with um, fast chargers to purchase. Uh, Jim Beshi uh, presented it a while back. Right. So we have a contract in uh, or an agreement with Fast Charge already. So thirty-two thousand dollars that we're getting basically pays for the chargers. The infrastructure is going to be um, our cost. Okay. Um, you said the city of Ann Arbor is doing the inspections. We're not within the city limits. And are they doing that at their cost, or do we have to pay them for that inspection? Well, no. We, when we pull the permits, we pay for that inspection. So, so we paid the city. We're, are we part? We're not in the city limits, so. Well, I'm sorry, township in our Oh, the township. township. I'm, okay. I'm very sorry. Okay. Yep. Got gotcha. I was thinking, wow, the city's being pretty generous. They're coming out here. To yeah. Do I mean, technically, the garage falls in Superior Township, but they always refer back to Ann Arbor okay. Township. Thank you. Anyone else? A little more. Sure. Oh, you do? 
Yeah, one more slide. This one more slide. So, yeah. So there are future deployment. I, I, I figured I'd better put this one up there because somebody was going to say, hey, why aren't we installing charging stations in front of the OEB, the TI building, and the BEB? One of the criteria that we put into the design was to say that if we were to install or connect to the building's um, electrical infrastructure, that we were not going to exceed 85% of its capacity. Unfortunately, the OEB, uh, the TI building, and BEB are already at that 85% capacity. So we couldn't automatically um, hook up charging stations to that. Now, the occupational ed building, uh, we already have uh, a design underway to increase the substation in the occupational ed building. BEB building most likely will not be uh, expanded just because it's more designed around a business education building than a technical building. But one, of the <coughs> excuse me, one of the things that could happen is if we do need to put charging stations near the BEB with the increased infrastructure to the SRB, we could connect the power from SRB into lot four there. So that would be a possibility moving forward. TIB building, um, we're um, actually going through and uh, consolidating power. One of the things that um, we learned was uh, all the um, parking lot lights from lot four all the way down to lot two in front of the ML building is fed from the TI building. So part of um, the lighting project that we're doing for the parking lot lighting is, is splitting that feed. We're gonna sever that feed right there in the horseshoe. TI building will take care of lots three and four and then we're refeeding parking lots uh, two and three from the ML building to free up capacity in the TI building. Questions? Let's see, sharing. So two questions. First one has to do with, um, well, first I'll say I'm very glad that we're moving in this direction. Um, I utilize the uh, chargers in the parking garage every time I'm on campus, so I'm grateful for that. Um, the question comes with, does DTE have enough power coming to campus for us to expand? Mm -hmm. Do we have any issues whatsoever? Because I know there's development projects across Ann Arbor where DTE has said, we don't have enough power for you. Yeah. Um, do we, are we running into any of those issues? No, not here. Okay. I mean, Never. you can actually look out and across the parking lot and we have those big high tension lines. So we have plenty of 13.2 volts coming into our facility where we lack is transferring that down and distributing right. throughout our buildings. And that's what we're working on is, is um, expand or expanding those substations. Plenty of power from DT at this point. Right. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Then in regards to the uh, bids that we received on the project, um, one of the things that I notice is the the that Harper on their materials front is quite a bit lower than the other, at least three other estimates or three other bids that we received, um, which I sort of thought material wise, um, they, it, it's the same material, but the cost seems very different. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. So the material cost not only includes the materials like uh, we, have, we have to buy a 1600 amp um, fuse pan or distribution panel. What they also put in there, and they all did that, is is that the subcontractor, somebody that comes in that does the boring of the underground, somebody that comes in that does the trenching. One of the things that Harper does is they're self-sufficient. They do that internally without having to outsource it. So there was a tremendous amount of savings that Harper was able to give us because they did a lot of that in-house. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. It was very Thank informative. You. Oh, you still got one more? No, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
I put this up there in case somebody asked, well, what is a substation? What is, what is that? Uh, one of the other things I should comment is, is that this project also is working in conjunction with the security camera project. So instead of them running at the Health and Fitness Center, the MLB, and lot six and seven, we were able to put the panels in for them, avoiding that that project's um, from doing it. We think we were saved probably between forty and fifty thousand dollars by putting the panels in ahead for them. Excellent. So, good planning. All right. Good looking up. Great job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Before I entertain the motion to adjourn the meeting, um, I just want to say that with this being our last board meeting for the 23-24 academic year, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you, would, you, oh. would you like to discuss the item? I'm sorry. He for, he, this was all the drum roll. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was something so this, else. Yeah, this is yeah the uh, electrical infrastructure upgrade for the fleet EV charging at the uh, shipping receiving buildings. So mm -hmm. as explained, um, you know we went out for bids uh, and Harper won the bid. The primary scope of this project is to install a uh, 1600 amp panel, which will give us enough power to feed the new EV charging stations, which would be located outside of the shipping receiving building, but also would give us about 25% expansion or growth for that building. Right now, the current 1000 amp panel is at its capacity. So this would, this would change the uh, panel with inside the building, giving us enough power to um, expand and also accommodate uh, the EV chargers. Uh, like I said, uh, Harper uh, won or was the lowest responsible build, bidder on 6636 RFP. Um, also, again, uh, this project will qualify for DTE rebates of about 32500 So the contract would be for uh, $243,000, and then once it's complete, we get our DTE rebates. That's annual? What's that? That's annual. Annual rebates? Yeah. No, that's a one-time that yeah, right. one incentive to install. Okay. Um, how long... So we can wait until September. Or do, or do we need to do this now? We can wait till wait. September. You sure? Um, the the panel that we order is about a 26 week lead time. So we wouldn't be able to get it in for this year anyhow. It's going to come in at the beginning of of next year, and we won't oh, really okay. be able to do anything till March or April. Of next to year. install it because of the frost laws and all that. So um, it, it, it can wait. There's no rush. Trustee McNagmore. I apologize for not thinking of this earlier, but you're saying before that there are certain areas that we're not able, you're not able to get into to install charging stations. Is, that's correct. That's correct. Well, because we didn't want to exceed uh, Eighty-five percent of the electrical capacity, because you, know, you got to safeguard some academic growth uh, within those buildings. So if they needed to add some piece of new equipment, we didn't want to take all the power, you know, for it. So we we leave some expansion for academic programs, really. Okay. So my thought is, is that I don't know what the, how what is the fleet number, but if the fleet number is more than what we have now, how is that going to work out with the charging stations? You know, cause, because the old fleet is going to have to be replaced. Right. And and are you going to replace it uh, one by one? Or are you going to be doing a fleet based on the need of where you want to have it at? It, it, it's almost kind of like the hen and the chicken. So we got to get the infrastructure in there in order to get the equipment in. 
We do have some EV um, uh, equipment. We just took delivery of two vans a few months ago. We have the ability to charge those, and that's why we've, we're rushing to get the, the fleet vehicles into the garage so we can you know, purchase more of those electric vehicles. One of the, um, the big things is, is our uh, grounds equipment. We've purchased these electric um, grave leaves, which are a zero turn lawnmower, and they're coveted. The guys want more of those. Those are, uh, they're a great piece of machine. If you think of it, instead of the gas mowers, this, these things are quiet. They don't produce heat when you're sitting on top of it. They don't vibrate. So it's a better piece of equipment that our guys are wanting. So that's kind of why we're rushing to get more fleet charging in here because we want to get more of this equipment in. But are you going to keep some uh, gas powered uh, equipment? Well, we're limited with technology. Uh, I'll give you an example, um, plow trucks. Even though they have F-150s, uh, you're not going to plow with one. Uh, right. So the technology is limited. Even our Kubotas that we have, those little like red trucks you see <laughs> running around here, there's no alternative for us at this point. Um, some of them we'd like to, you know, get over to like uh, a small Ranger, um, but they don't make electric Rangers yet. And we don't want to buy those big F-150s just because that's the only thing available. We're trying to right size our, our fleet. We're actually reducing, once this is going, we'll be reducing our fleet by at least seven vehicles. Um, that's significant. Right. Yeah. Okay. I can't think of anything else. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. I'm done. Are we good? No, he had a question. I, had a, I have a question. Sure. So I, I'm pretty sure it was in today's, maybe yesterday's New York Times, the federal government releasing more money for sure. climate change infrastructure, mm -hmm. which would be charging for electric vehicles. And if there are some money coming up that's going to be available for release, um, it's possible maybe we could reach out to our congresswoman and see if there's any angle that we could get to maybe get some of that money to help with these charging stations. That would be, yeah. And I, don't, I don't know if that's, if we could put that with Kirk Profit or whoever the right person to be to, to go after that. I mean, there are other rebate programs, but it's generally centralized on municipalities, cities, and stuff like that, which we don't qualify for. Uh, we we'll have take a look. We'll take a look. Yeah. We'll take a look. I'll bet our congressperson would go to bat for us. My suggestion is uh, contact uh, Simcock, which I can do because I'm on the transportation committee. So I'll bring this to them if we can get a proposal. But if that's if there's new federal money coming up, sure. I think the president, the current president, wanted to push out some more money before his term ends. So yeah. but I'll be at my meeting on Friday. Probably. I need to know what you need so you can ask for exactly. what you're going to ask, exactly. so that he could write what you need. Does exactly. that does that make sense? Okay. Sure. All right, so somehow we need to talk. Okay. Okay. And also what you're saying, you know. I've been drafted to preside over the balance of the meeting. Is there any other business to come before us this evening? If not, we'd accept a motion to adjourn and support. All in favor, say aye. Aye. It's been a great meeting. Thank you.